Hello, everybody. Welcome to part six of this Magdalene series, where we are reading through the book, Mary Magdalene Revealed, The First Apostle, Her Feminine Gospel, and The Christianity We Haven't Tried Yet by Megan Watterson. I personally want to thank all of you guys for leaving such positive comments regarding this book. As I've told you guys a lot on this series, reading this book, I'm actually reading through these sections live for the first time with you guys. When I normally do the missing books of the Bible, I typically study and read beforehand what I'm going to present so that I can do research on the history of the book and the subject spoken about. But with this particular book, I'm doing it I'm reading it right here with you. So all of the emotions that you see me have in this video are very raw and very, very real. And I am so touched that you guys are also sharing your experiences as we go through this really powerful book together. In my opinion, the most important part of this book is understand the teachings of the gospel of Mary, Mary being Mary Magdalene. A lot of the Gnostic Gospels, a lot of the Gospels that have been removed or banned from the canonized Bible, teach us that human suffering is something that we can control. And that kind of like with the teachings of yoga, that the ego, which is what Mary focuses on a lot, the false sense of self, is not the soul. And part of her teaching, as well as Joshua's teaching, Jesus' teaching, was to understand that your soul is pure, loving consciousness. So for me, that's the most important lesson learned from this book that Megan Watterson is writing. And of course, she's, she's using a lot of her life experience to show you the obstacles that happen in our life, give us opportunities to experience the core of who we are, which again is loving consciousness. With that being said, in this book, she does talk a lot about the finding of the gospel of Mary and what we see as Egypt, as well as I know we're going to be getting into going to the south of France with her to try to find and visit Mary's cave. I want to make it clear that I actually am very hesitant as to whether the archaeological places, the geographical places, they tell us these things happened are the actual places that these things happened. We know that so much of our history has been manipulated for nefarious purposes. And in my own study, just to be very transparent with you guys, in my own study, I now believe that the, ge the geographical locations of the Bible are not where they tell us they are. My opinion could change on this, and this just has a lot to do with stuff I've been sent from um, somebody who's in the military, so I'm, I'm not going to share the source yet. That makes me question if um, Mary was actually in what we call the south of France. From what I can tell and what I've seen, a lot of um, the locations of the original Egypt, Israel, Sumeria, all that kind of stuff actually might have been on the American continent, making Gaul or France, Canada. Again, with this being said, my opinion could change later on as more and more information comes to light. And it could be that because our continents were at one point put together as Pantagia, maybe they separated a lot sooner and are like closer to us in timeline and they tell us I, I don't know that I don't know but I do want to make that clear as we get into the south of France but again my opinion on where these things actually happened on our planet they're still kind of in the air I do kind of think they're not where they tell us they're supposed to be but like I said, I'm not set in stone on that. The one thing I do know for sure from this paperwork I've seen is that Mary herself, Mary Magdalene, was not Jewish. She, uh, Her father was the Ptolemy line that ruled Egypt, wherever Egypt was, meaning that he was of Greek descent. And her mother was Nordic. And so with that being said, Mary Magdalene, the, the paintings we see of her with the reddish, blondish hair and blue eyes, those are actually pretty accurate to what she would have looked like. She was not Middle Eastern in the way that she looked. She had very, very big blue eyes, um, very fair, fair hair, fair skin. She got more of her um, DNA, the way she looked from what I can see from her mother, who again was Nordic. And I find it very fascinating that her mother has been pretty much erased from all of these books. So I'm very curious as to who her mother was, because obviously she herself was a very powerful woman. We know that Yahshua himself probably was not Jewish either. I know that's shocking to hear because the Bible has been so manipulated to try to convince us of a storyline that perhaps isn't true. But 
as I'm, the way I see it, it doesn't even really matter what they look like. It doesn't even really actually matter where they did these things. What matters is that they were trying to teach us who we really are. And they were trying to carry through the Christ consciousness, the golden light of the Lyran group or the Christ consciousness group. They came here as two ascended masters, two twin flames, the divine masculine and the the divine feminine to teach us that we are not subject to enslavement, that we have carry that pure love of God within us, that we carry that fractal of light. That is the Christ consciousness. And we have to get out of our own way, out of the false illusion of the ego, the false sense of self in order to find the true the truth of who we all are. And that truth literally has nothing to do with what we look like or where we live on the world. And so with all that being said, it doesn't even actually matter, but I did want to kind of cover that before we get into this section, because I always want to be transparent with you guys about my research. Many of you have heard me say that I started this channel as a way for me to prove present certain research in like a storytelling way so that I could get your feedback too. As Aristotle said, it is a sign of an intelligent mind when you can entertain an idea without accepting it. And hopefully all of us together can really kind of get to the truth of who these two very incredible humans were. All right. So we're going to start with the chapter titled The Yoni of the Mountain. The companion of the sun is Miriam of Magdala. The teacher loved her more than all the disciples. He often kissed her on the mouth. The Gospel of Philip. The first man I met in Paris was a tall vagina. His costume went from his shoulders to below his knees and included some very accurate anatomy. And judging from his bare arms and legs, it seemed to be the only thing that he was wearing. He was just sauntering through the Gare des Nord as if in normal attire. The man vagina was with two other men. So so I tried to take a picture of him. They beckoned for me to come join them. Then one of them offered to take a picture of us. So that became one of my favorite pictures of my pilgrimage to Mary Magdalene's cave. Me cracking up in Paris, standing next to a man wearing nothing but a full length vagina. I was headed down to Aix in Provence from Paris to have dinner with a woman I had never met before. Rose had sent a message to me through Instagram shortly before I got on the Queen Mary. And typically, I don't reply to these messages, but her profile picture showed a red thread on her left wrist, so I read it. She said that she had moved to the south of France with her daughters for the past year in order to be close to Mary Magdalene, both her cathedral in St. Maxim and her cave at St. Baum. We suggested we meet for dinner in Aix, which is the closest city to St. Maxim. It felt important that I meet her, but I didn't know why yet. And I'm going to apologize if some of my French pronunciations of these towns and places is off. Um, I don't speak French, even though I did study French in school. I, I don't speak French. One time in Paris, I was able to have some sort of a conversation with a local regarding where the bathroom was, but that was about it. And um, most of the French that I hear in my life is coming mostly from Creole. So the pronunciation obviously is going to be a little bit different, just like English in America is different from English in England and Australia and South Africa and so forth. The accents are just different. And so I apologize if the pronunciation is not the French, as in the country of France's French pronunciation. I needed to get from the Gare des Nord to the Gare des Lyon to catch a train to Aix in south of France. I went to stand in the taxi line and an English woman arrived in line behind me. She told me that she was late to catch a train and the only one headed to Barcelona from Gare des Lyon. I suggested we split a cab and her face lit up. She helped me lift our bags and myself over the gate and out of the line. We got into the cab and started talking. Then my face lit up when she said she was from Devon. I told her about the workshop I was holding in Devon later that month. We hugged at the station after she helped me get my ticket to Axe. I felt drenched in this sense of how magical it can feel to be led from one synchronicity to the next. Rose was waiting for me outside of my hotel. And before I could even introduce myself, we started laughing. We both noticed that we were wearing the exact same Mary Magdalene medallion. She felt immensely familiar to me. We walked slowly through the sand-colored buildings and the gorgeous light that seemed to thicken the air. 
It felt like we were walking through an invisible warm bath as we wove our way through the maze of narrow streets to the a bistro in the alleyway filled with the brightly painted shutters and flower boxes. As we waited for the food to arrive, we started sharing what being a devoted to Mary Magdalene has taught us. There's scriptural evidence in the Gospel of Philip that Mary was referred to as his companion, or konos in Greek. This word can translate as married partner, counterpart, beloved, companion in faith. The fact that Philip goes on to relate that not only is Mary Christ's konos, but that he loved her more than all the other disciples, and that he often kissed her on the mouth, suggests that their partnership was also physical. Which we are going to get into in the next book that we're going to read in this series. Read, which is the Magdalene Manuscript, because according to this book, from what I understand, Mary Magdalene was technically the one who activated Yahshua, who activated his enlightenment. I have been studying the, uh, the, the Lyran group because that's, I've learned that's where my soul is from, is from the Lyran group. And the Lyran group does carry the aura of gold and silver. And so I know I carry more of a golden hue, as many people have pointed out before I even realized that was what was happening. But the deeper I study the Lyran group, and I could be wrong on this, again, I'm just sharing with you guys what I have found in my research, is that the Lyran group, because they're one of the oldest souls in the galaxy, one of the first souls created, they do carry the element of the Christ consciousness. We all carry it, but they are the kind of the people that try to push you into that Christ consciousness, right? So the gold... The people that carry gold carry the power of what we call Kundalini. Now, Kundalini has definitely been manipulated by the dark cult for sure, but it's not that. It's just your, your Christ consciousness enlightening through Shashumna, which is actually a nadi or a um, tunnel of energy that lives within your spine. Now, in saying that, every person carries Kundalini, but the golden lyrans, the energetic essence, is the stimulation of that Kundalini. And the silver lyrans, they carry the control of time. I still am kind of confused about this. I don't really know what this means, but that's kind of what I'm seeing. And a lot of times with the twin flames from the Lyran group, because a twin flame is one soul that has divided into two beings, a divine masculine and a divine feminine, they one will carry the gold and one will carry the silver. And so when they come together sexually, that's when there's a vibrational activation through the coming of the rising of that Kundalini through the gold element and the time control through the silver element that vibrationally comes out through that union energetically into the world. I know this sounds crazy and weird, but just go with it for now. Again, this is just stuff I've been studying. My mind could change later, but it's interesting. And what I understand now is that Mary Magdalene, her last name Magdalene, again, does not come from Magdala. She was not from Magdala. I believe I said last week that Magdalene means the tower. What well, also refers to the womb, the chalice, right? And so Mary Magdalene herself is part of the bloodline of the Magdalene of the Christ, but it's not necessarily her that is the Magdalene. Again, this goes back to her mother, which is so hard to find information on her mother, which now I'm understanding why, because her mother apparently was quite a very big powerhouse. Her mother's womb was the Magdalene chalice. And of course, what goes into a chalice in a holy union to create a baby? Well, that's the seed of the man. And so Magdalene also refers to the, her mother's line of, of this group. Her mother apparently also carried the golden element as well. Her father carried the silver. Now, Mary Magdalene, again, Magdalene is not Magdala. It does not come from a town and it does not come from her father. It comes from her mother. Her mother was also through the priestess sort of Isis where Magdalene, Mary Magdalene was, was trained through the priestesshood of Isis as well as Yahshua. And so this is all very fascinating to me, this stuff, the way the magic kind of works. And we're going to get more into that into, again, the Magdalene manuscript, where we kind of learn about her activating Yahshua. And that is because the divine feminine always is the one to activate the divine masculine. Now, in this case, Mary carried the golden aura, which was the aura of Kundalini. 
this doesn't mean that the man can't have a kundalini awareness without the woman of course he can but she carried that element that essence not all female lyrans are or lyrans are the gold element some of them are silver so that doesn't correlate to either masculine or feminine but in this case that's how it was and she mirrored the same as her parents her mother was gold her father was silver and so this is just really really fascinating i mean i don't know about you guys but the truth the magical truth of who we are and what we carry and who we've been is way way more exciting than the crap they taught us right like this is exciting okay whether they were ever sexually united or not for me is less important than the fact that they were a couple a duo partners they were meant to be seen together understood as a whole that maybe part of christ's teachings could only be completed with and through her what feels most important to me is that we've forgotten and willfully buried this aspect of Christ, that he was in love with Mary. Rose and I agree that what this has meant for us spiritually to have a belief in Mary as a singularity significant to Christ that isn't validated on an institutionalized level is that we have to validate this belief for ourselves. We've had to become fierce about recognizing what's true for us. And we both felt as though this is something that our devotion to Mary Magdalene has asked of us personally. We needed to learn to believe in ourselves, in our own voice, in what we know is true, even if the world around us does not confirm this truth for us. Cultivating a sense of self-worth seems to be a compulsory part of the spiritual path of Mary Magdalene, because we cannot believe in ourselves if we don't remember that we are worthy of that belief. It felt good to be in a communion with another woman who understood Mary as I do, and to be with someone who has dedicated her life to her in the same way. Her red thread kept catching my eyes as she lifted her water glass for a drink. We remember her, it seemed to whisper, and now we're remembering each other. As if we're circling back, coming from out of hiding, out of the wilderness and into the clearing. Now we can remember her together. I had a steady assembly line like flow going of picking up a french fry ducking it into the mayo and then hauling it into my mouth as we talked but then rose suddenly mentioned the cave of eggs a mayo typed fry halt abruptly mid-air my jaw dropped the cave of eggs i said is both a question and an explanation because at first it didn't feel real that it could exist that my obsession with Mary Magdalene's connection to the egg could be validated by a secret, a mystical cave that I had never even heard of before. It's a place for the initiated, Rose said. Not everyone finds it. Then she showed me a picture of it, and I could see why. This cave was clearly the yoni of the mountain. Its entrance was a rock version of Georgia O'Keeffe's painting, Pure rose petals folds of stone lined a dark opening. That is why I had come on the pilgrimage. Not to go to the cave the church has created in honor of St. Balm, as I had thought. The one that I had heard about in St. Maurice de la Mer almost 28 years ago. I was here to find this secret cave. The cave of the X. And that goes again back. I didn't know that she was going to talk about the eggs, but that again, it goes back to the womb, the womb being the chalice, the womb that holds the egg and the seed of the man in a powerful form of vibrational lovemaking that creates a baby, that creates consciousness. And so that's pretty powerful. And I know that Magdalene is often associated with the eggs as well, the golden egg, to be, to be clear. What I heard in Mary Magdalene's crypt. The soul replied, what binds me has been slain and what surrounds me has been destroyed and my desire has been brought to an end and ignorance has died. The Gospel of Mary, chapter 9, verse 27. The Mary Magdalene Basilica in St. Maxim in the south of France sits back from a small med medieval road built in the center of the town. There's a large square made of smooth, beautiful stone that stretches out before the entrance. When I passed through the doors, I didn't feel like an intruder or an outsider, as I usually do. It felt like if there was ever a church where I belonged, it would be here in this basilica where Mary Magdalene is most revered and most remembered. Rose was waiting outside to let me have alone time to explore the church. She had driven from Ox to the small village in St. Maxim, and then she'd helped translate for me 
at La, La, La Covent, at La Covent Royale, the Covent turned hotel that's attached to Mary Magdalene's church. She explained to the receptionist that I wanted a small room that faced the church courtyard and that I would need a ride and that I would need a ride to her cave at St. Baum in the morning. Rose's face was glowing as she said all this. She was so small and powerful. She reminded me of Sarah La Kali, the patron saint of the gypsies, queen of the outsiders. Her devotion radiated off her skin. Her hand gestures to accompany her eloquent French were quick and graceful, almost hummingbird-like. The temperature fell nearly 20 degrees inside the cathedral. It was in the upper 90s outside. This region of France is sunny for the majority of the entire year. And in the summer months, there's a steady, unrelenting golden light that pours down onto the bright, ancient designs of St. Maxim. The church, which is thick stone, somehow traps the cooler air and its protection from the sun comes as sanctuary. There was a tall plastic Christ on a pedestal near the entrance to Mary Magdalene's crypt. It was the kind that didn't give me the creeps. Christ is pointing gently to a sacred heart blazing in the center of his chest. He's in a red and gold toga outfit and his one foot is bare and exposed beneath his rose as if he's taking a step forward. I watched as an elderly couple approached him. They were each kissing their fingertips and then placing their hands lovingly on his foot. It was a gesture I was certain they made very often together, maybe every day. Once they moved on, I stood so that his downcast gaze met me eye to eye. I had an earache and a slight fever. The three fates had been convinced I got it from all the swimming I did on the ship's pool. As far as I could remember, I have never had an earache before. I kept assuming it would just go away, but it had gotten worse. I was dabbing some eucalyptus oil around my ears each morning to try to pull out the water. It made me smell bizarre, like a walking throat lozenge. I tried throughout the day, plunging my nose and blowing out the pressure trap there in my ears, but nothing had helped. It still sounded like I was underwater or holding my breath. I noticed the stigmata in Christ's foot. This is what the couple must have kissed. I knew then that this life-size statue was meant to represent the risen Christ. I pressed my fingertips to my lips and touched the lacquered cement toes. I knew if anyone was watching, they would know instantly that I had never kissed, that I had never kissed Christ's foot before. I descended into the crypt then, with my Vicks vapor rub following in a waft behind me. There, there are several even polished steps that lead to the entrance. There's an alabaster statue behind a glass of Mary Magdalene reclining with her head tilted back as if hearing something that had overcome or overwhelmed her. Her eyes are closed as, she, as if she's listening intently within. Then there are several... Un uneven stone steps that lead down into the crypt itself, clearly marking a more ancient part of the cathedral. It was even colder in the crypt. As I descended, I noticed that people had etched messages in the wall. The writing was an almost neo-white set against the dark stone. What caught my eye was the large M and C drawn with a heart. Sacred graffiti. I smiled. Then I ducked my head held the rickety metal railing and took the final three steps down. I tried to make sense of this odd looking gate at the back of the crypt. I had to really squint and focus to see what was caged behind it. At first, I thought it was some sort of scary golden eagle with a skull face. I got as close to it as I could and realized then that the golden wings weren't from the bird, but an angel. There were four golden angels holding up her skull from each corner, and the skull was wrapped in a red cloth. I could just see the edges of it framing her skull in red. There was this odd see-through glass bubble that protected it. The skull had been sealed inside this case since 1974. What is scientifically known about the skull is that it's the skull of a female who most likely lived until about age 50 had dark brown hair, lived in the first century, and was not originally from this region of France. There is no scientific way to determine if the skull is Mary's, but the fact that it had been venerated for hundreds of years as if it is, seems to create power of its own, a truth, she existed, the truth insists. She was a real figure of history and not just a legend. This skull has been paraded around St. Maxim every July 22nd in honor of Mary Magdalene's feast day for hundreds of years. That's not her skull, guys. I'm telling you right now, that's not her skull. 
I think I know where her actual burial is from what I've been given the information I've been giving. I'm not going to say it yet because again, I don't want to get this person in trouble, but she's not buried in, in France. That's not, that's not her school, but it's a sweet honor to homage to her, but that's not, that's not her. My eardrum was throbbing from the infection. There was one of those adorable prayer stools right in front of her gold encased angel supported skull. It had red velvet on the cushion for your knees and it creaked a little when I kneeled and placed my elbows on the wooden bar that extends up from the stool so your arms don't get sore before your prayers are complete. In Mary 927, the soul ultimately triumphs. After confronting these seven powers of the ego, the soul is free. Ignorance has died. The soul tells us the illusion of the ego that binds the soul are slain desires and illusions come to an end, but what's left is what endures. And this is love. This is how I interpret Mary nine 27 love wins. As I took a deep breath and began to meditate, all I could hear was this rushing fury of blood coursing through my heart. My ear infection was creating an earplug effect. The lumbering, clamoring pump of my heart was insanely loud. It was distracting. All I could think about then was how hard it works always. It's this one constant. Without me even realizing it, it's the one most important sound that keeps me here. Then in the silence of the inner clamor, I suddenly heard, to walk with me is to walk as me. Any and all projections were immediately powered down, like a movie projector coming to the end of the film reel. Veneration becomes a very different thing when you're honoring another at eye level. The message to me meant that if Mary Magdalene owned all of her power, she wouldn't want me to give away any of mine. There can never be a spiritual authority outside of me that is greater than my own voice within. This voice of my own uncaged heart. It's interesting. She said to walk with me is to walk as me. That's one of the famous lines that Hanuman from the Hindu mythology says, when I don't know who I am, I serve you. When I know who I am, I am you. I am unabounded love. And the ear thing too, and the fever thing too. I know you guys have heard me talk about this a lot. This is something that they talk about a lot in the East and these old spiritual practices, but something in the West we're not accustomed to. And I think they intentionally don't let us know this, but like I struggle with ear issues. I have, since I was a baby, I had tubes in my ears as a baby, I get ear infections a lot. Um, and I know a lot of other people who've been heavily invested into their own spiritual paths in their life. Uh, people I've met have also struggled with ear issues. It's kind of something that happens, I think, to people that are trying to find um, the truth of the human soul and also fevers. Having a fever is really common when you go on a spiritual path. In the yoga, we call it the yoga fever because every time you understand something a little bit deeper about who you really are, where you really come from, as far as your soul, it creates a new pattern in your consciousness a new opening, a new passageway. And in order for that new passageway, that opening to be fully expressed and used, your body has to burn off the old. That's why when you have a fever, it's not really good. And this is not medical advice. This is just some spiritual practices. It's not good to like take something to take the fever away. You need to allow the fever to do what it needs to do to burn off the karma, to burn off the old patterns. And it's just a part of, of the spiritual path. We have this really warped view of light and love in the Western world that when you take a spiritual path, you're going to all of a sudden just be walking into light and love, but that doesn't come for a really long time. This true spiritual path is like darkness and, and ego deaths and is painful. It's really painful because you're letting go of your false sense of self. And after you're able to move through that pain of the false sense of self, then you find true liberation or moksha. I've spoken a lot about Hanuman lately, about how Ram um, got Hanuman, the monkey god, to go and rescue Sita from Ravana, from the Ramayana, and bring Sita back to Ram. Ravana was the ten-headed demon who can't be slain. And Ram and his wife Sita, Ravana stole Sita from Ram and took her to Sri Lanka and hid her in the forest. And you know, Ram was devastated. He couldn't find his beloved, his twin flame of Sita. And so he hires Hanuman. And Hanuman is the monkey god whose father is um, Vayu, the wind, the breath right and Hanuman forgets that he has all these powers these special powers and so when he's on this voyage to serve Ram to help find Sita he remembers bam Pratibha this flash of illumination that he's Hanuman 
he has abilities and he jumps from the, the shores of India all the way to Sri Lanka to get Sita and bring Sita back to Ram. Well, the thing is, is something I haven't really talked about much is that when he finds Sita trapped in the forest, he sees her, he spots her, he, he, know, he acknowledges where she is. Most people would say, oh, well, he'll just kidnap her and bring her back to Ram. But that's not what happens because he knows that he has to go defeat Ravana. He can't avoid the hard stuff. He can't avoid this demon god, Ravana, the ten-headed demon. When you cut one head off, another one grows back, this impossible beast to destroy. And I won't give it away if you're interested in the story, read the Ramayana, but he does defeat Ravana, I won't say how, and he brings Sita back to Ram. Well, Ravana, if, if, if Sita is our soul, the representation of our soul, and Ram is God, and Hanuman is our courage, our, our physical courage, our consciousness, the courage of who we are to bring our soul back to God, then Ravana, Ravana is the ego. It's the ego. This beast that can't be slain, but yet is slain. But we have to do the work. If, if Hanuman were to take Sita back to Ram without defeating Ravana, Ravana would just come back and look for Sita and it would just happen all over again. It's like in our lives when the same shit happens over and over and over and over again and we never seem to learn. It's going to keep happening over and over again until we actually take that courage and stand up to it and fight it and work through it. And that's that's what spiritual spirituality is. It is, it's all internal work. It's not about going to a church or going to a temple or having a priest tell you what's right and wrong, having a rabbi tell you what's right and wrong. It's not about any of that. It's about understanding that you are loving consciousness. You're not your ego. Your ego is, lives in fear. Your ego is fragile. Your ego is the false sense of self. Your ego will die with your body. It's not real. It's just a part you're playing in this life. All the lives you've lived, it's just parts you've played. So what is real then? What is real is that which is eternal, loving consciousness inside of you. And so this brings us to the fifth power, enslavement to the physical body, which is interesting. I just talk, talk, spoke about that because that is actually, and according to the Yoga Sutra, according to the Yoga Sutras, enslavement to the physical body is really what's the cause of man's suffering because the physical body represents the ego, represents the false sense of reality. Our, our delusion, our illusion, our maya, as it is in Sanskrit, is that for me, I am Bryce. That's who I am. No. I'm not, I'm not Bryce like that. This is just a role I'm playing in this life. This is like an outfit I'm wearing, you know, my past lives. I'm not those people either. Those were just roles I played. What's consistent is the soul within me. And, and so part of the ego death is realizing that you're not your identity is realizing that you're not, I'm not Bryce. So then who am I? Like, that's scary when you first start to realize you're not yourself. And so it's funny that the third, fifth power is enslavement to the physical body. And so we become attached to that physical body. We become attached to the property, to the nature. Nature is anything with a birth, a life, and a death. And because it has a birth and a life and a death, that means it's always changing. And because it's always changing, that means it's not in our control. And therefore, human suffering exists. But what isn't changing, what is always consistent, is the soul. So here we go. The Princess of Mercy. For centuries, Kuan Yin, the Buddhist deity of compassion, was depicted in iconography as a male. But then at some point in the 7th or 8th century, Kuan Yin morphed into a female. And it is a belief that he became a she because of the extraordinary mercy of a princess named Mao Shen. Mao's dad, the king, was the worst possible man. The kind of man, as his role in the story demands, that is very difficult to ever want to forgive. He tried to marry off the beautiful and brilliant Mao to an equally horrible, wealthy man three times her age who lusted after her and wanted her as his prize. And the king wanted to secure more wealth and power for himself through the marriage. So when Mao refused, he banished her to a remote island off the coast of China to live in a monastery. Mao embraced her banishment. Yes, the island was barren, the nuns were starving, and they were all isolated from the rest of humankind. But for little Mao, it meant she was free. And all she knew and tasted was the magic of getting to be her radiant, loving self every day. She didn't see barren earth all around her, but a field of potential. 
She taught the nuns to garden and plant. And with several years, rumors were beginning to reach the mainland about the succulent vegetables and verdant gardens with the beautiful blooms that had turned Mao's island into an actual paradise. When the king found out that Mao was thriving and that his punishment, in a sense, had rewarded her, he ordered his guards to travel to the island and burn down the monastery, along with all the food and flowers Mao had helped grow. Supposedly, just as the monastery caught fire, Mao made it rain, shaman style, by pricking the tip of her tongue with a hairpin. A torrential rainfall began and quickly put out the raging fire. This, of course, only made the king more furious. He then sent his executor to kill Mao Shan for being such a disobedient daughter. Are you in love with her yet? I am. The king's executioner was having a tough time as he found it difficult to cut off Mao's head. Every form of sword he used, no matter how mighty or sharp, would shatter the instant it touched the skin of Mao's lovely neck. In some versions of her legend, he gives up and she is speared away by a glorious glowing white she-tiger. In other versions, he finally succeeds and before her last breath, Mao has already forgiven him. And the depth of the mercy he experiences from her forces him to his knees. And so her executioner becomes her first devotee. Either way, Mao's next stop is hell. She is spirited away to Yama, ruler of the underworld. Yama, we talk about Yama in yoga a lot. And she immediately senses all the people suffering around her. She hears their screams, their urgent cries for help. And because she remains true to who she is, no matter where she is or what anyone has done to her, Mal responds to them with love. And just by turning towards them, listening to them, acknowledging their pain, she witnesses them where they are. This frees them. And so one by one, Mal liberates each soul and slowly turns hell into heaven. Freeing souls from hell, however, is bad business for Yama. He knows that unless he wants to oversee an empty realm filled with flowers and souls in full bloom, he needs to kick Mao out. So he sends her back to life with a gift, the peach of longevity. She lives in a cave. At this point in her story, so many female saints seem to love to do it sometime in the trajectory of their lives. She, and she admits an otherworldly fragrance of the most beautiful flower in bloom. The cave is on the island of Putushan, and she lives here meditating every day for many years in peace. She becomes well known as a healer, as someone who gives the medicine that only mercy can. An energy that doesn't seek to fix or change and never judges or shames but rather just sees, accepts, and remains. A compassion that changes everything just by mirroring back to the one who is suffering, that at last her voice has been heard. News reaches Mao that the king is deathly ill, and that the only way for the king to live is to receive the eyes and arms of a person who no longer experiences anger. Mao immediately gives her eyes and arms in order to save the king, her father. I know. Really, I see sacrificed martyrdom. This is the last message we should ever need. Self-harm and self-sacrifice has nothing to do with true love. I pounded against the story for a while, and I wasn't sure if I wanted to know the ending, but I had fallen in love with Mao, so I kept going. And I remembered, as I forgot so easily, that the king is not a man separate from me. I am the king as much as I am Mao. All these characters... All the characters of every story exist within me, within us all. The king receives her eyes and arms and is restored to health. For the first time in the king's life, he feels grateful. And with that newfound gratitude, he becomes curious about who exactly saved his life. He wanted to meet his savior. He is told that a beautiful hermit living in a remote cave is the reason he's alive so he travels to her cave to honor her for profound for this profoundly selfless act when the king sees that that person who saved his life is mal the daughter he had tried to marry off against her will had banished to a chaste nun on a desolate island had attempted to burn out for her home in order to be executed simply for being a radiant soul that she is at this the king falls to his knees at her transfixed by the magnitude of her mercy at this moment, Mao transforms into her true form and thousand-armed incarnation of compassion, the goddess of mercy, Wan Yin. 
Flowers of every kind fill her cave, and the radiance of who she truly is can finally be perceived by everyone there to witness her. This is when I got it. I suck at math, but I heard her message loud and clear. When I imagined little armless Mao Shen with suddenly a thousand arms, I got the exchange rate. Two arms given with love. Not because the recipient deserves those arms. Not because the recipient has ever given the giver anything but suffering. But two arms given just for the sake of giving. This level of mercy allows the universe to give back to the giver a thousandfold. The word mercy comes from the old Etruscan merk, meaning exchange. It's explained that all of life is an exchange because giving is receiving, is the energetic frequency upon which our universe is aligned. We have to give of ourselves, meaning it's when it's hard to give or when it hurts to give that we receive the most in exchange. This is because what we lose is the ego. When Mao gives her arms and her eyes to her father, she's symbolically giving away her egoic identity and handing over her ability to see and her ability to be physical use in the world. She's detaching herself from her physical body. She's giving back to him what was actually never hers. Her ego's illusion that she was the object at his disposal, that she was a piece of property obligated to obey his desires, that she was a dependent daughter in need of his control to dictate her life, and that she was not capable of knowing who she truly is and just how infinitely powerful she has always been. Ultimately, she gives all these limited beliefs back to him. And then he is able to see out through her eyes and move in the world with the same love that guides her. Ultimately, the mercy Mao gives the king isn't about him at all. It's about setting her true self free. Whether he deserves her anger or not is irrelevant. If she chooses to remain angry, she chooses to remain chained to him. And this means remaining enslaved to the ego. Forgiving him unabinds her. Forgiving him means she realigns with the law of the universe, which is inherently merciful. The universal law of giving is receiving. Mercy, I think, is the embodiment of compassion. I can have compassion easily for just about anyone. Once I hear how they've suffered, I have compassion on how and why they then perpetuated that suffering by causing harm to others. What's hard for me is the personal compassion. The mercy that's required of me when I forgive someone who has done me immediately and direct harm. My ego masquerades as this superhero, hands on her hip, or like Gandalf, with his staff in the depths of the underworld, proclaiming to the horrible demon fire beast, you shall not pass. The trouble is that the anger of the ego, even when righteous, can also erect some serious walls in my heart. And this doesn't hurt the person who harmed me but it blocks me from the flow of the universe. It disconnects me from what it means to be truly alive, to give and receive love. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Mercy is at the heart of the prayer of the heart because mercy is what returns to the heart. Mercy is the power of Christ. A power that isn't a power over, but a power with. Mercy is about a perpetual transference of power. Mercy is the energetic exchange at the heart of the universe. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me.